Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, joining us for today's webinar. My name is Kylie Gursky. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the program officer at the Women's Foundation of Montana. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Women's Foundation is a strategic initiative of the Montana Community Foundation, and we work with donors and grantees across the state to break down barriers to equity for women and girls in Montana. Um, and we are honored to host this panel today. Uh, we've been long committed to women's leadership, both as an equity issue and as a critical component of really um, what makes organizations, systems, and communities really function best. Uh, today, we're presenting Developing Leaders for Montana's Future with insights from women who are spearheading leadership development efforts in our state. Um, representing the business sector, academic and public policy sectors, and youth leadership development. And the reason um, for our focus on leadership development today is really because of you. Uh, during our recent conversations with donors and grantees over the last year, we've heard loud and clear that the health and economic crisis of the past two years has highlighted the need for better designed systems um, in education, in childcare, uh, in healthcare, and more, um, and really better systems for essential workers, for family caregivers, for women and children. Uh, we know that our communities are in need of fundamental changes in, in how we work and learn, um, in how we provide care and connect with one another, uh, and how we really build those communities. And so what we heard from Women's Foundation uh, donors and supporters in our community is that what's really needed to make this fundamental change happen is strong and effective leadership across all sectors. Um, and the Women's Foundation uh, knows that the key to creating systems that work for everyone is bold leadership that's really grounded in equity. Um, and there's a need for us to build the capacity of leaders at all levels. And I think that that's what the, the, repre the representation on our panel really is, is going to highlight throughout our discussion today. Um, so our, our panelists will be sharing their perspective on the current landscape of women's leadership in Montana, um, the opportunities uh, for women's leadership and where they see women still facing barriers. So I'm gonna take a few minutes and tell you a little bit about our panelists uh, before we, we get started. And then uh, after I do that, I'll kick it over to the moderator um, who, will, who will sort of guide our discussion today. So joining us from the Mansfield Center at the University of Montana is Executive Director, Dina Mansour. Thanks for being here, Dina. Uh, the Mansfield Center is an academic unit of the University of Montana that's dedicated to enhancing mutual understanding between the United States and Asia, and um, dedicated to fostering ethical public policy and leadership. Um, since 2010, Dina has served as part of the leadership team of the Mansfield Center, supporting the international, international exchange programs of more than 1,000 1, Montana and inter, international students and professionals. Um, she served as a consultant for the State Department throughout mainland Asia and has lectured at a number of foreign universities. In specific uh, to her, uh, her perspective today, she's also developed the Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Montana which is committed to gender equity and leadership and works to build empowering institutions that improve opportunities for women. And she's also been the administrative director of Montana New Leadership, which has been a grantee of the Women's Foundation and is a program that educates, empowers, and encourages college women to become politically active and to take on leadership roles. Uh, joining us from the Prospera Business Network, which operates the Montana Women's Business Center, is Business Development Director, Susie. <laughs> Susie, thanks for the wave. Susie Bridget White. Uh, the Montana Women's Business Center provides the necessary tools and support to help women establish grow and sustain businesses throughout the state of Montana. Um, and they give women the opportunity to excel in business and contribute to the growth of economies throughout our state. Uh, Susie has been a business owner, a fundraiser, a human resource manager, public speaker and trainer, really a jack of all trades. Um, she has counseled more than a thousand business owners throughout Montana and serves on the Montana Ambassadors Board and is the vice chair for uh, the Bozeman chapter. She also serves on the City of Bozeman Economic Vitality Board and is actively involved with the Montana Economic Development Association um, and Bozeman Connect. Thanks for being with us today, Susie. 
Um, and joining us to talk about youth leadership development efforts is Shannon Stober. She's the Red Ants Pants Foundation Girls Leadership Program Lead Facilitator. Uh, the Red Ants Pants Foundation provides grants, timber skills workshop, girls leadership programs, and also hosts the Red Ants Pants Music Festival. Um, and the Girls Leadership Program grew from a vision for better developing, supporting, and connecting emerging female leaders, um, really cultivated specifically to build upon the strength of girls from rural Montana. Shannon is a trainer, facilitator, and coach, and the founder of Jumpstart. Um, she has completed two terms uh, of service with AmeriCorps VISTA. I, myself, an AmeriCorps VISTA alum, and Kelly Curtis is the Women's Foundation uh, VISTA with us this year, so strong, strong uh, national service representation. Um, and then she she went on to serve as the statewide training officer for the Montana Governor's Office of Community Service. Uh, from there, she served as the program manager for Montana Campus Compact and invested eight years working with the Montana Conservation Corps, earning the title of director of programs. So thanks so much, Shannon, for being with us today. And uh, last but certainly not least is Morgan Targison, who's going to be our moderator. Excuse me, Megan. Megan Targison uh, is a writer, creative entrepreneur, and founder of the podcast Reframing Rural. And if you haven't had an opportunity to listen to her podcast, I highly recommend it. Uh, her work, Reframing the Narrative on Rural America, um, has earned her multiple fellowships and awards. Megan is fueled by storytelling's ability to bridge divides, and she splits her time between uh, producing Reframing Rural, helping on her family's wheat farm, and providing communication, storytelling, and fundraising services for nonprofits, including the Red Ants Pants Music Festival. Um, so with that, I will kick it over to Megan, and I encourage everybody to um, be active in the chat and ask questions and um, Megan will will facilitate that and um, thank you all for being here and Megan I'll hand it on over. Thank you so much for the introduction Kylie. Thanks everyone for being here and the Women's Foundation of Montana for hosting this conversation. Leading up to this panel in addition to researching the work of my inspiring conversation partners today I've been reflecting on women who've modeled leadership or played a formative role in my development as a freelancer and the creator of a grassroots media initiative. Among the many women who came to mind are community volunteers, nonprofit leaders, academics, farmers and ranchers, policy advocates, and women who have modeled new ways of doing things or who've been transparent with me about their consulting rates or who've encouraged me to take risks. Women like Assistant Professor of Arts Leadership at Seattle University, Roxy Hornbeck, Kim Rudningen, a leader who wears many hats in my small hometown of Dagmar, Montana, and Sarah Calhoun, whose leadership in business and rural prosperity has had ripple effects that touch many sectors across the state and country. I'm very much standing on the shoulders of these women today, as I know all of us are standing on the shoulders of women um, to whom we owe much reverence and gratitude. We need women in positions of political leadership, women who are tenure track professors, board presidents, and business owners for our collective society to prosper. And as we hear from Shannon, Susie, and Dina today and ponder the landscape of women's leadership development in Montana, I invite us to consider the women who show up as leaders in our lives and the many ways their guidance builds confidence, community cohesion, a resilient economy, cross-cultural and international collaborations and places for social gathering. So to kick us off, Shannon, I have a, a two-part question for you. As someone who is helping steward the next generation of women leaders, from the vantage point of youth development, what opportunities in women's leadership are you seeing emerge and expand? And where are young women still facing barriers? Thanks, Megan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So excited to be here representing the good work of the Red Ants Pants Foundation. Um, so in terms of where I'm seeing opportunities that are emerging um, for emerging leadership, um, it's all very positive. Right now, we're seeing a lot of growth in identity and affinity-based spaces, um, particularly in sectors that have traditionally been uh, underrepresented or historically excluded women. So I'm thinking about things like large landscape conservation, certain aspects of the agricultural community, 
um, women in trades, etc. So really starting to see a mobilization and looking at women's voices in those communities and being intentional around providing them with skills, strategies, knowledge, and ability to continue to express that leadership versus what has traditionally been done, which is figure it out on your own, you're in the deep end of the pool and hopefully you can make it work. Um, so I think that's been incredibly positive. Um, another thing that I'm seeing specifically when we're thinking about emerging leadership um, is just a big shift in the type of content and curriculum that we're delivering to these young people. Um, historically, oftentimes these leadership curriculums are really focused on what the leader does, right? So establish a vision, set goals, objectives, manage it. Um, and there seems to be a balancing of focus around who a leader has to be, um, which is drawing to the surface things that have traditionally been considered feminine, right? Things like our social emotional intelligences, mindfulness, resiliency, embodiment. Um, and so I think that that's great because we're starting to really see this picture of leadership rounding out to include other elements that are good for anybody regardless of their gender identity. Um, in terms of where we still face challenges, I think with emerging leaders in particular, there's still a lot of work to be done around identifying those individuals and messaging leadership to them in a way that resonates specifically with women. Um, oftentimes, emerging leaders this day need to carry an affinity of some sort to be invited into the leadership development circle. So maybe an affinity with the academy or affinity with some type of professional base. Um, and we're really not capturing the people that we could by being narrow and, and requiring affinity for access. I think the Girls Leadership Program with Red Ants has done a great job um, at sort of casting that wide net, reaching out to women who never in their life would have considered themselves to be leaders um, and trying to encourage them and message leadership as something outside of being charismatic and getting people to follow you. Um, so I think that we have to be thinking critically about where are those emerging leaders outside of those kind of traditional pipelines? How are we talking about leadership? What are we asking them to do if we know leadership identity um, is a major barrier? What's that ask we're making of them um, to come towards us? And how might we be thinking more critically um, about really deepening the playing field by reaching women who don't have that pipeline and don't necessarily identify with the idea of being a leader? Yeah, I, I was revisiting the article um, from the Montana Women Mag Woman magazine about the Girls Leadership Program this morning and um, was really struck by a quote about how powerful effective mentorship is and um, the journalist likened it to a nurtured space tended to like an early spring garden. So I, um, I think you're doing really wonderful work and I'm grateful to have gotten to meet some of the, the girls who've come through the Girls Leadership Program. Um, and Dina, from the perspective of globally minded leadership and, and women's leadership in academia, what opportunities are being cultivated in women's leadership development and what challenges still remain? Okay, well, Megan, thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this panel. This is a group of spectacular women here and also Women's Foundation has been so instrumental to supporting the women and the people of Montana. So thanks for including me. Um, I'd like to just briefly start to, to um, you know, springboard off your very generous introduction to talk a bit about what the Mansfield Center is, because we are so here to support all of you on this call, all the people of Montana. We were founded by an act of Congress in 1983 to foster globally minded leaders of integrity, to build off Mike Mansfield's legacy of ethics and public affairs and international engagement. So when we look at supporting the people of Montana from our place at the University of Montana, what we are trying to do is support people in being um, better able to be competitive in a global economy. And that doesn't mean that you are specifically working with international partners directly. But the fact is that our economy is increasingly intertwined. The Women's Foundation is here to support women economically. The University of Montana is here uh, to support inclusive prosperity and democracy. Um, and looking at the fact that if you look at the state of Montana, we are near the bottom at all international indicators, people who speak a second language, people who study abroad, people who work with international business. And the reality is that you could be at your family bakery in downtown, um, you know, Whitehall, Montana, and you are affected by the price of grain, you are affected by uh, global um, wage issues. And so we try to support women and people in Montana in being more globally engaged and understand the forces that are at play here in Montana that affect all of us. 
So we do this for, through a variety of ways. Um, and certainly part of that is supporting uh, women's leadership here at the university and, uh, and around the country, the state. So, you know, Shannon was incredibly positive. And I, and I also remind myself that I need to be positive because certainly it is really challenging to be a woman in leadership. Um, that, you know, I, uh, I am a 52 year old woman and I certainly did not think that we would be where we are here as a nation um, and as a state in terms of women's rights and the position of women in leadership, but we have come incredibly far. So um, the Mansfield Center together with our former president Royce Engstrom with the support of current president um, Seth Bodner started the Women's Leadership Initiative in 2015, recognizing that if we are educating um, young students, students of all ages, uh, men and women, that they need to have role models in their campus leadership. So the Women's Leadership Initiative supports the employees of the University of Montana in developing leadership of women at the very highest levels. And we've been fortunate to bring in Clearwater Credit Union employees into that and really looking to expand the cohorts. When we started the Women's Leadership Initiative, you would look at the stage at the State of the University address in the fall, and there would be the male president, and there would be his cabinet behind him, and there would be maybe 14 people, and two would be women. And this is shocking. You know, how, what are we saying to our young women and our young men by having such a, an imbalance? Um, the University of Montana has worked really hard to rectify that. More than half of our deans are now women. Half of the cabinet is women. Um, we have new positions. We have the director of the Sea Change Initiative um, to provide safe, empowering, and accelerating opportunities for women. That is run by a Native woman. Uh, we have a brand new director of inclusive excellence that is uh, run by a Native woman. We have the director of the Office of Disability Equity that is run by a woman. Um, so I'm seeing increasing opportunities um, that while we certainly have our challenges, I feel really inspired by um, the landscape and the opportunity of what we have here at the university and what we're trying to provide for our students and for the state. I'm just really inspired by all the role models that um, Dina, you've mentioned too in our earlier call. And, and Susie, um, when we spoke earlier, you were also really hopeful about the landscape and the possibilities of female entrepreneurship and the work that's being done through Prospera. And I'm wondering if you could speak to this landscape of women's leadership in the business community in Montana. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. Um, I would like to take just a few moments to share with you guys a little bit more about what we do. Um, the Montana Women's Business Center is a statewide organization that helps women start and grow their businesses. And so we're more focused on the entrepreneur side of, of kind of women's leadership. And so um, I am very hopeful right now. I, I think about when I was running this program starting in 2016 and where the program is right now in 2022, you know, back in 2016, there weren't networking as many networking groups for women there weren't co-working spaces just for women there weren't grant programs just for women so the needle has been moved and it's been very exciting on this end to to be able to share with women business owners all the different ways that they can be supported for instance we have a statewide program called 56 strong it's a statewide um, mentoring program where we've um, matchmaked women from across the state with mentors. And that program is about 115 people strong in the state. And that has really helped move the needle on so many different businesses throughout our state. And so just small things like that, there are incubator programs now, there's, there's just so much more programming now for women that it just makes me so excited for the future. Um, I have two daughters. And so I think about how much it has moved in, in, in Montana just over the last few years. And I'm really excited for them to be able to have more entrepreneurship opportunities, but also just more leadership opportunities if they decide not to start their own business. So, um, you know, where I, where I am still struggling and where I'm seeing some of our female entrepreneurs struggle a little bit is access to capital. Um, we just see across the board that women have less access to capital in terms of commercial lending, um, venture capital, and angel investing. Just 
the numbers are staggering the difference between men and women in terms of the funding that they're getting. And so that's one area that we continually work on in terms of educating women with, with um, financial um, acumen, with giving them more tools for understanding finances, what to ask for, preparing them more for these asks. Um, but then also we've started our own grant program called the Montana Women's Business Center Impact Grant, where women um, throughout the state who own their own business can apply for up to $6,000 to help take their business to the next level. Sometimes those small micro grants can really make a huge difference in terms of leveraging their, their, um, their revenue and growing their business. And so I always say when you invest in women, you really invest in communities. And I, I do think that's true because women are always the ones thinking about jobs, thinking about how they can give back to the community. Um, how their role in society can impact a community for the positive. And so that's our goal here is just to help women continue to do great things for their communities. In one article, Susie, that you shared with me after our call, um, it, it, the stat was shared that while women own 30% of small companies, female business owners account for less than 5% of all the capital lent to small companies. Um, and similarly, like 7% of funds are distributed to women by venture capital firms. So of course, there are real challenges that still exist that we're still working against. And I think of the confidence gap in young girls as well that um, Shannon, the Girls Leadership Program is addressing. And so I'm wondering um, if you could all speak more specifically to how your programs are continuing to address these, these issues. And um, Shannon, I guess we'll, we'll kick it back to you. You bet. Um, so I'll take an opportunity to briefly provide an overview of what the Girls Leadership Program is, and then we can talk about how we're reaching the outcomes. Uh, before I do, I want to name that the, the use of the term girls, that was actually came from the young women that we serve. They identified that term and embrace it and have requested it. And so I think there's people externally who would rightfully wonder why we're using that word. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that that came from the young women that we're serving. Um, so the Girls Leadership Program uh, was born of Sarah Calhoun's vision to be more intentional and deliberate with women's leadership in the state of Montana. If you look at the full suite of offerings from the Red Ants Pants Foundation, you see that there is community investing, there's opportunities to do carpentry skills, timber skills, um, to engage with the Red Ants Pants Music Festival. And so this was a movement towards being more intentional around leadership development, but the whole foundation is really about women's leadership development. Um, in those initial investigations, what became clear was that there was an opportunity to be more um, focused on working with young women, specifically in rural communities. Um, you know, our data led us to see a handful of opportunities in designing that program. So we were focused on bringing fundamental leadership skill development to these young women, which we refer to as strength. Uh, we were focused on getting them connected to the communities where they reside um, and to contribute to those communities in a meaningful way, which we refer to as pride. Uh, we were focused on helping these young women, again, absorb the identity of leader, understand what that means, um, and have access to strong um, supporters and sponsors and mentors um, to help them understand the role they can play as leader, which we refer to as courage. Um, and, and in our program theory, all those things amount to hope, which is a positive view of the future and a positive sense of self. So that's kind of the program theory. We engage eight young girls uh, each year. They're all rising juniors located in rural communities uh, throughout Montana. And in addition, we engage eight mentors. So these tend to be working professionals from a variety of sectors and backgrounds. Um, and that will be that year's cohort. Uh, that cohort will come together for three in-person multi-day leadership retreats. In between retreats, we meet virtually. They design community projects. Uh, and the mentors and the girls undertake a variety of different mentoring activities, depending upon what that relationship uh, warrants. Um, we're seeing tremendous outcomes, number one, in confidence, um, women seeing themselves as leader, feeling like they have the tools to move things forward. We also see people really identifying themselves as a community asset, which I feel is important for these young women to see themselves as being value added to their community. Um, we're also seeing a huge sense of belonging that emerges, which is so vital. Um, and so to create this very intimate cohort of young women from around the state and create that sense of belonging alongside women um, who are not within their age bracket is pretty, pretty exciting stuff. I think the most high potent component of this program that we couldn't have necessarily known when we began would be what manifests when we have those adult women and those young women in the space for three days, engaging in incredibly vulnerable work and incredibly honest and authentic work, dialoguing, sharing stories. 
um, that multi-generational component of doing that work together in person has proved to be incredibly powerful uh, in terms of mentoring these young women, showing them the way, but also asking these working professionals to really question their assumptions about young women and their potential. Um, and I've seen these working professionals take on a new spirit towards advocating for emerging leaders. Um, and I think gatekeeping can still be a problem in women's leadership. So to see these young professional women really take the charge of cooking, kicking down gates on behalf of young women is powerful. So yeah, that's kind of what we're doing. And it's having that multi-tiered effect and a lot of really positive outcomes. Wow. Can you share a specific story of impact and um, one of the girls who's gone through the program? It's so funny. I knew you were going to ask that. And it almost defies the way our program is designed, right? Because it really is about that cohort in that community. And so teasing one person out just feels like, oh, gosh, but they all have these stories. Um, <clears throat> but I can tell you, I will share that we had a young woman this year who was in the program. Um, and she's from Wisdom, Montana. So when we say we're serving rural communities, we mean very, very rural. Um, she was a primary example of somebody who came into the program. Why? Because her dad thought it would be a good idea. She never saw herself as a leader, um, wasn't a term that she identified with whatsoever. She developed such a powerful sense of community with the members of her cohort, uh, connected well with all of the, the mentors. And when she was charged with designing her community project, um, you know, kind of spun around, like, what can I contribute or what can I do? And then she decided to create one of those little libraries in Wisdom. So you can have the little library where you come and you exchange your books and this and that, recognizing like Wisdom doesn't have a library and you have young people who like access to resources and, you know, members of the senior community who, you know, to have that ease of transitioning and getting reading. And it's just one example. Each of these girls have come in and just developed a very new sense of identity, um, pushed through some challenges and thinking about how to use those skills and um, have brought things to their community that have really made them feel valuable. That's just one, but every person who's come through the program, I could tell you the same story about. Wonderful, thanks, thanks so much for sharing that, Shannon. And um, Dina, could you speak a little bit more about Montana New Leadership, the Women's Leadership Initiative and the Fellows Program and, and also the, the um, inspiring story of Beatrix Frizzell that you told me about last week? Yeah, um, you know, I'd love to talk about a couple of programs where, uh, you know, everyone listening to this program can can maybe be a part of it. And one is our Montana New Leadership Program. And this is an exciting program that's hosted by the Mansfield Center, but we are part of a nationwide network. Uh, the Center for American Women in Politics is one of the preeminent uh, centers of its kind in the United States. It's hosted by Rutgers University, and we've been part of that network for about five years. And what we do through Montana New Leadership is we educate, empower, and encourage college women to become politically active and to take on leadership roles. So we recruit women statewide for a cohort of 20 individuals. They can come from the Montana University system, from tribal colleges, from private colleges. Um, they can be Montana women who are studying outside the state and come back for the summer. But it's, it's really a year-long program where we are preparing them to use their voices and to support the causes they care about so passionately. So we're not necessarily expecting these women to run for office or take political leadership, but to become really comfortable in advocating for what they care about. So it is a five-day residential program here at the University of Montana. Um, we work with the women to prepare for it in the months before it. We encourage them to do a project uh, using the lessons learned in that experiential program. Um, and it's really just um, bringing them together, uh, having them develop a cohort of others so they can support one another, introducing them to dozens of women and other leaders that are brought together from around the state to support them. Um, and you know, just to draw on one quote by one of the alumni, she said, walking into the first day of the Montana New Leadership Program was akin to stepping into the most thought-provoking, introspective, and inspirational classroom the Montana University system has to offer. A week of discussion and debate between individuals from all backgrounds and with varying interests reaffirmed my confidence in the goodness of my peers and in the abilities that I bring to the table. So, I mean, this is just a really exciting thing to take women at this young age and to help them um, decide what the next steps they see are for their own community and for themselves. 
Um, we have one woman, as you mentioned, B. Frizzell. She's from Polson, um, and she partic participated in this program. And it's just been incredible to see how she has developed. She um, is one of the recipients of the prestigious Truman Scholarship. She's involved in climate justice. Um, and she's just really uh, taken what she's learned and supported high school students, her peers here at the University of Montana and her home community and, and just doing great things. Um, one of the things that she helped advocate for was um, some of her transgender colleagues on the uh, cross country team here at the University of Montana and, and just really getting involved in helping others see that despite different cultures and different viewpoints that we have more uh, the same than we have different. So we would really encourage any of you on this uh, call to nominate women for this program or, or get involved yourself if you are a university woman. The other program we have, uh, Susie on this call has been involved and others at the Women's Foundation have been involved in this, um, is our professional fellows program uh, on civic engagement. This is a federally funded program through the US Department of State to bring people of different cultures and backgrounds together, uh, people between Montana and the Rocky Mountain West and 11 countries in Southeast Asia. And it's in a variety of fields. It's in healthcare, it's in education, it's in rule of law. Um, we have social entrepreneurs. And what we do is we bring these um, women and men from Southeast Asia to Montana and other states for a month where they work with their, um, their host and something that they're both incredibly passionate about. And then after that month, the American partner has the opportunity to travel overseas. So it's truly a two way exchange. Um, but we find a lot of people aren't even interested in that travel component that by hosting someone in their home organization, that they get a real global perspective on the work they do here at home. And they're able to um, really add some new avenues and different perspectives in their work. So this is another program. We've just welcomed 25 Southeast Asians to Montana in the last few days. And and so if you're interested in participating in that program, it is a really tremendous leadership opportunity. And though it's available to both women and men, we see the majority of partners um, are women, both in terms of the Southeast Asian travelers, but also with the Montanans that, um, you know, we find that women are willing to put themselves out there more for this kind of exchange opportunity, are more interested in sharing of their expertise and just really interested in gaining another perspective. Thank you, Dina. And I'd just like to invite everybody, if you have any questions specifically about um, our panelists programs or the leadership modalities that they subscribe to, feel free to um, put them into the chat. And what I'm hearing across um, all of our, my conversation partners today is that these programs are really breaking down barriers across industries and gender identities, cultural backgrounds and geographies. Um, for example, Prospera Business Network's um, 56 Strong Women's Mentorship Program is really creating um, community across all 56 counties in Montana. I was really excited to learn about that program, um, given my background in a very remote county, Sheridan County in Montana. And um, Susie, I, I was wondering if you could speak more to your programs and give a, a story or two of impact um, from the amazing women business owners that you've helped mentored over the years. Absolutely. Um, like Megan was saying, 56 Strong is a new program for us. And we have just always wanted to launch the statewide mentoring program. But, you know, this last year we had surveyed so many of our female business clients and they said, you know, I felt like a, I was, I've been alone for about a year. And so we decided, hey, let's break down barriers. Let's do an online mentoring program. And so we launched this program in January and it's just closing up here in, in June. And it's a six month program. It's been free for people to do it. And like we said, we match make these people from across the state to find a mentor and a mentee. And what I've loved about it is that so many people have really been challenged and they have, you know, not only met online, but they've met in person. They've crossed the state to meet with each other just to connect and meet with each other face to face. So it's been really fun to watch that. But one specific success story I wanted to share with you guys is that we were working with a woman who works in a rural or lives in a rural community um, over by the North Dakota border, and she started an online clothing company. So she was just selling direct to consumers. 
Um, through this course, she was matchmaked with someone um, who has done some work internationally, and so ended up helping her find a new um, a new manufacturer for her clothing line. So that has saved her quite a bit of money, but also encouraged her to actually start to sell her products throughout the state at Montana um, women-owned boutiques. And so from that, her her she has she now has nine accounts here in Montana and has tripled her sales just in the last six months by doing this kind of boutique tour of Montana at all these women-owned um, retail businesses. And so that's just one success story that has come from this event uh, or this program where, you know, we're literally closing up this program tomorrow and we're going to hear more success stories. But that was one that I wanted to share with you. Another success story I want to share with you is that, again, developing leaders, we have a course that teaches people how to start their own business, really gain the confidence to not work for someone, but to run their own business. So understand the, the technicalities of taxes, financials, um, hiring your first employee, all those things that you know, people ask and wonder about when they're about to transition into owning their own business. And so we have a course called Power Up. And that course is offered each month and we rotate between an online version and then an in-person version because we know everyone is at different places in, in their life. And so we had a we had a woman take this course I think maybe five years ago. And she was from Cambodia, ironically, because I'm about to host someone from Cambodia. Um, she took this class because she was in an abusive relationship and was leaving her husband. And so we, of course, gave her a scholarship for this program and she decided to start her own house cleaning business. And so five years later, she is married to a new husband, has a beautiful baby, and is about to sell her business. But in the meantime, she was able to buy a house for her mom in Cambodia and open a library in Cambodia. And so that one class gave her the strength, the confidence, and the tools to be able to start her own business, have financial independence, and be able to do something not only for herself, but for her entire community in Cambodia. And so that's just another um way that we try to help these women succeed in running their business. We're not just there to give them just facts on how to start their business, but we're there to provide mentorship, open doors for meeting other business owners and making connections for them. I think part of starting your own business is also imagining a different future for yourself and for your communities. And a lot of the um, programs that we've been talking about today have also kind of spoken to that envisioning and imagining of a different future. And so there's a framing that I like to ask podcast guests and clients that I'd like to pose to the three of you. And that is, what do we stand to gain? And um, conversely, what do we risk losing um, if we if we don't um, achieve gr greater representation of women in leadership positions. So what does what does the world look like with more women in leadership? Um, and what does it look like if, if we don't um, kind of really rally behind the movements that have been happening to have greater gender equity? And I welcome anyone to, to answer that question as you um, become inspired. You know, I've been thinking a lot about this. Like I said, I have three children. I have two girls and a boy. And my oldest is just about to go to college. And I've just been thinking about how much progress is being made. And the more that we as individuals, the 23 of us on this on this call, the more of us that do whatever we can to get women in leadership roles and help protect those roles and help educate women to get into those roles, the better it is for this next generation. I just think about how much easier hopefully it will be for, for my daughters to be able to enter into leadership roles, into um, potentially entrepreneurship roles, things like that, having seats at the table and boards and things like that. I just think it's so impressive how, how much has changed um, for women in the last few years. Obviously we have you know, we have more diversity, equity, inclusion panels that are happening. We have more um, corporations that are, are doing more DEI work. I'm just seeing so much progress. And and why I do it is honestly for my for my daughters. You know, I want it to be easier for them when they when they get older. Yeah, I would. I, I have similar sentiments on that. So two of my fundamental leadership beliefs are that all of us is better than one of us in what we do and how we do it are of equal importance. 
Um, and I think about continuing to amplify women's voices, continuing to amplify non-binary voices just means that we're getting better adequate representation of what is happening in people's lives. And I think people inherently have a right um, to express their opinions and be included in influence and decision making about the things that matter to them. So it is about how are we making sure that all of us can be at the table um, and that we're working in a manner that draws out those voices, honors those voices, makes a promise to commit to taking that information and moving it forward. So for me, it really is just that broad justice lens um, of, you know, as we think about leading communities, whether that's from a business standpoint, an academic standpoint, right, all of these different lenses, like adequate representation um, and respect will always get a better product. All of us is what better than one of us always. So I just think that that makes whatever we do in the future better when everybody's at the table. I'll just add, you know, like Susie, you know, I have a daughter, I also have a son. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm Egyptian, so they have the, the full range of, of um, challenge, I, challenges, I guess you can say, being BIPOC. And, um, and I, what I do see, you know, as Shannon also mentioned, is that, you know, the world is increasingly intersectional, that we had some real challenges with the feminist movement in terms of white men, women being narrowly focused on their interests. So I really appreciate that here in the state of Montana, even though we don't have the diversity that we might see in urban areas, um, we've really been integrating more discussions with native, with BIPOC community in general. So that's been fantastic. Um, you know, but like Susie, I do this for my daughter. I do it for the students that I see every day here at the University of Montana. I do it for my son. Um, and I don't see that we have moved as far as we need to, that I cannot imagine that I'm having these discussions about the challenges of women's leadership with my kids kids um, in the 21st century. I was just in Helena for the 50th anniversary of the um, Montana Constitution. And we were talking a lot about Montana values and to make sure that what is foremost in our mind is communicating the relevance of the Montana Constitution to those values. And I see the same for women's leadership issues that we constantly need to be communicating the value of women's leadership to every single person in the state of Montana that it benefits us all and that we could be better at really talking about how these are not just women's issues, that this is an issue for everyone. And so, you know, I really thank the Women's Foundation of Montana for, for being a leader in that area. And the other women on this panel are doing phenomenal work. It is hard work and it is constant. And I've been seeing a lot of articles in the national press recently about the challenges of feminism and what percent of women and men um, have a negative perception on that. And, you know, I am a proud feminist. I work at a a nonpartisan organization, um, bipartisan organization, but I really stand behind the issues that some people may see tend to to be liberal. They are not liberal issues. These are bipartisan issues. These are nonpartisan issues. And how can we, everyone on this call that cares so much about these issues, how can we amplify the importance of this for every Montanan? And Dina, given your four, uh, 20 years in foreign service and your just understanding of the lot, uh, larger landscape of women's leadership across the globe, could you also just speak to um, the importance of intersec intersectional thinking and gender equity on an international level? So, you know, I was really fortunate to be a diplomat. We work with international visitors every day here at the university from all regions of the world. Um, I will say, you know, looking at the Southeast Asian cohort we have now, we've been working with Southeast Asia since 20, 2010. And I've seen a dramatic change. I've seen more opportunities for women and girls. I see that our women speak better English. Um, you know, the fact is you need English or another global language to be successful in a lot of countries outside our borders. We are incredibly lucky that English is the dominant language in the world so far. Um, even though one of our problems is that we are not uh, learning languages in Montana. And, you know, one thing I would say for every woman is that you are better off if you speak a second language, Mandarin Chinese, Arabic, um, Spanish, one of these languages um, will really help you to better compete um, in any arena. So I do see our women taking on um, more leadership roles. I see them being um, able to be more prosperous, that their families are more prosperous. Um, so I do see kind of that women are um, increasingly supported 
um, regardless of the regime. I mean, we're working with communities that are democratic, that are communist, that are authoritarian, that suffer terrible human rights abuses. Uh, we have women that are here from the Philippines where uh, the son of uh, Marcos, who was incredibly authoritarian and had a reign of terror. I mean, thousands of people were killed or disappeared under that regime. And now his son is in power. And we see women that are scared for their children and their grandchildren and for their livelihoods. Um, but despite that, I have seen some hope in these women. So I think that we can all see hope. Um, we can all continue to support programs like Montana New Leadership. I mean, that's one of our challenges is that the Women's Foundation of Montana has funded it. It's a relatively inexpensive program at about $25,000 a year. But honestly, we weren't able to run it this summer because we were not able to get the support we needed from the Montana University System and other traditional partners. So, um, you know, we just we need people who can afford it, um, like Red Ann's Pants. A fantastic organization. Um, it's great that they're doing so much for the community and I hope that we can um, work with other corporate partners and communities across Montana to support these important programs. Thank you very much for that perspective. Um, to wrap us up, I was just wondering, and Dina, we'll just kick it back to you since we were um, on that topic of how people can get involved with your programs and um, spread the word about your organization's good work. Well, I would love every individual and every organization represented on this call to be part of the Mansfield Center programs that, you know, the pandemic has been horrific um, and it is never ending seemingly. But one of the gifts of the pandemic is something like this virtual dialogue where people can be connected in ways that they wouldn't have otherwise. So, you know, if you're interested in uh, learning more about the Mansfield Center programs, email me and we'd love to put you on our mailing list. We had 9,000 people registered for Dr. Fauci's talk in the midst of the pandemic. We had uh, 2,000 people signed up for former Governor Roscoe talking about fidelity and and what it means to be an elected official and faithful to the constitution. Um, so, you know, get on all of our email lists. I see, for example, Susie's Prospera emails are fascinating. She offers so many great opportunities for walk workshops and, and um, to get involved. Um, if you're interested in Montana New Leadership, uh, either nominate a woman or be a speaker or a, a mentor during our speed dating event. We have lots of great ways to support these young women from across Montana. Uh, we actively engage women from tribal colleges, and we've had a really good percentage of um, Native women participate in our programs as well. Um, the international components that, you know, if you really don't know where to start, you've never thought about getting involved with an international partner or international work, um, email me about that, that, you know, I mentioned Whitehall earlier because we had sent a Vietnamese and a Cambodian participant to live in Whitehall and work with the Economic Development Corporation there. And what a phenomenal experience it was for the entire community who came forward to provide home hospitality, dinners, um, a homestay. Um, and it, it just really changed a lot of perspectives and, and supported kids in a different way of thinking. So if you're interested in meeting with an international person for an hour, for a weekend, for a month, um, please get in touch with me. And thanks again for letting me be part of this. It's really exciting to talk about a group of people who really care about women's leadership in Montana. And Susie, in addition to your newsletters, how else can people get involved with Prospera? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to be putting a couple different links in the um in the chat box here, but one is applying for a Montana Women's Business Center impact grant. So if you or someone you know needs some additional funding to kind of take their business to the next level, um, we've got our Women's Business Center impact grant that opens January 1st every year. Um, so we have four different awards that total up to about $20,000. So people can apply for that grant there. We also have our 56 Strong Mentoring Program, and I'll include the link um, in this as well. Um, right now, we're taking names for people who want to be interested or want to be involved in the next cohort. So go ahead and fill out this form here, and we will make sure that we connect with you at the end of the year to see if you're interested in being a mentor or a mentee. 
We also have lots of different um, programs like women-owned business tours where women can hear stories from different women from lots of different walks of life who have started a business where we go to their retail business, whether it be a health and nutrition shop or their doctor or um, their marketing branding agency. We've got the ability to, to be able to connect these women who are who are looking to to share their story about how they started their business, financed it, um, who their mentors have been, things like that. So that's a really fun way to get involved too. And then last but not least, obviously we're always looking for support as well. We're a nonprofit organization. And so we've got our big prosperity party fundraiser coming up in September. And so we're looking for folks who wanna donate auction items or are interested in sponsoring. All that money goes to our Montana Women's Business Center program. So that keeps our business counseling program free and accessible to all. And then we also have a scholarship program for all of our business trainings as well. So that is also helpful money to kind of make sure that women are getting access to all the all the trainings and counseling that they could possibly need. So um, reach out if you have any questions. And obviously my email will probably be um, sent to all of you guys as well. And I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Susie. Lots of great opportunities to get involved with Prospera. And Shannon, to bring it home to you, um, how can people get involved in both the Red Ants Pants Foundation's Girls Leadership Program and like broad, broader programming? You bet. <laughs> um, so specific to the Girls Leadership Program, I think the number one thing folks can do is help us spread the word that it exists. We are working with a really, really narrow um, sort of lane of young people, young women, rising juniors in rural Montana. Um, so just letting folks know that opportunity exists. And we have great partnership with other statewide youth development organizations that are putting the word out. But what we know is that the young women who are finding our program and getting the most from it are being re recommended by their family members. So tell your friends, tell the people you know, even if they don't have high school kids, they know somebody. So that word of mouth piece is just massive. Um, second, as has already been mentioned, we don't charge for this program, right? So that's part of it is keeping it accessible. So we do not charge anything um, for the young women to participate in this program, and we fully support our mentors' engagement in this program. So donating is always great. I mean, it just actually takes cash to make these things work sometimes, and so there's always opportunities to support in that way. Um, and with that, a great way to support all of the women's leadership efforts that are coming from the Red Ants Pants Foundation is to attend our festival. Um, so a percentage of those proceeds go back to supporting all of the women's leadership initiatives that are coming from the foundation that includes the girls leadership program, but timber skills, carpentry skills, the community grant making project. So um, if, if you want just a really fun way to support us, um, come out and join us at the festival. Uh, I also serve as the volunteer coordinator for the festival. So if you're not in a position to be able to do that to purchase a ticket, you can always support us in that manner as well. Um, and then finally, I think one of the beautiful things of all of the different components and initiatives of the Red Ants Pants brand um, is just this natural organic convening that happens. And so as we look to the future, um, engaging our alumni communities, figuring out how to continue to develop those women past their experience with us, um, we're always looking for women to share their times and talents. And so just reaching out to say, hey, I'm into what you're doing and here are some strengths and expertise that I carry. Um, we're always looking closely at those things to, to continue to build that fabric. So I think there's always just a general call to, to reach out and, and just come and, and join us and let us know what you're up to so we can see what's emerging. Beyond that, I just really want to say that I, going back to where I began, um, which is there is a lot of work to do to identify emerging leaders still. Um, so look at your community, look at your neighbors, question your own assumptions about young people and the pipelines that we sort of ask people to move through um, in order to access these types of programs. And I think women being willing to step forward, not just as mentors, but as sponsors who are willing to actually move other women through the doors, get them at the table. Are you willing to leave your seat at the table so that somebody rising behind you has that opportunity? Um, I think those are all things, those small just mindsets um, that we can do while we're working on some of these bigger issues. Thank you, Shannon, and every one of the panelists. I can second that the Red Ants Pants Music Festival is a wonderful um, example of women's leadership in action and just a great celebration overall to kick off the summer. Um, thank you so much, and I'll, I'll uh, pass the baton to Kylie. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to say thanks to our presenters uh, for sharing their valuable knowledge. Thanks to Megan for moderating that uh, discussion. The contact information for each of our uh, speakers is up on the screen in front of you. I encourage each of you, like they said, if you have any 
questions or or want to get more involved or want to support their programs to to absolutely reach out and get involved they outlined a number of opportunities and um i i just want to uh reflect that i think that the past you know hour of conversation has really highlighted how we have to balance the work of of trying to um survive and thrive in systems that are not built by and for women, particularly BIPOC women, trans women, low-income and disabled women. Um, and part of our work is to really just survive and do the best that we can for ourselves and our families in those systems. And then part of the, the work is to reimagine and reshape that. And I think that the leadership development work that our, our panelists outlined really hold that balance. Um, and I'm just grateful that it's that it's being done, that you're doing it, thankful for your leadership. And I know that we just scratched the surface today of what you do and what the, the folks who are involved in your leadership programs do. Um, so thank you for sharing that, that little peek into the important work that you do. Um, the Women's Foundation will continue to explore how to best support work that develops leaders in our, in our communities. Um, we'll work alongside you, the folks who attended today, our panelists, um, and, and we'll continue to uh, move financial resources to these efforts um, and make sure that we're creating and promoting more opportunities for women and girls in Montana. Um, I think we have a link to a brief survey in our chat box. Uh, like Kristen said, it would be great to hear your thoughts on how we can improve the experience and future content. I, um, I'm getting the, the idea that maybe some content in the future about uh, redefining leadership like what that what that is looking like in in communities across Montana, um, the state and globally, uh, it might be might be something for us to consider um, digging into a little bit more in the future. Um, and I hope you all uh, will keep an eye out for that. Um, and join me then and uh, maybe we'll see you at the Red Ants Pants Music Festival this summer. So thank you all so much. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.